Hello, I'm Matt Tassaro. I'm going to be talking about Barbican, uh, protecting your secrets at scale. If I say um, Cloud Keeps a couple times, that was sort of our internal name before it got this official name. So <laughs> I'm going to warn you, I may use both terms. I, I may say Cloud Keep, I may say Barbican. Apologize if I mess them up. But then we started calling it Cloud Keep, and then we renamed it Barbican. So I, my brain gets confused. Uh, but this is about protecting your, your secrets at scale. A quick little background about me. I'm Matt Tassaro. I'm, I'm a former OWASP board member. I started the Live CD project back in 2008. It's kind of morphed into OWASP WTE, which is a bunch of Debian packages of AppSec tools. I've been at Rackspace since October of uh, 2011. I work for the Product Security Group, which is our internal AppSec group that works actually in the product dev organization. I'm testing our products and I'm sort of trying to hack the rack, right? And my other, my other cohort, who is not here, uh, who did actually a lot of the work. He's the one running the team, actually, that is creating this product. It's Jarrett Rehm. He's uh, been a developer. He worked for the Denim Group for a while as a consultant. He's been at Rackspace for four or five years now. Um, he's the one who actually runs, this is where I have to say this very carefully, I do product security for Rack. He creates security products for Rack. <laughs> So like he creates the stuff that we sell to customers and I try to break the stuff that we sell to customers, okay? But I've known Jarrett for a number of years, we're good friends. Um, he and I, this kind of evolved out of many lunch conversations and drawings on napkins and this is a problem and how do I address it? This really actually came out of a problem of, as a security professional, I hate going to dev teams and saying, you're doing this wrong. And when they say, okay, what do I do? I say, I don't know, but you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Right? So this was an attempt to provide, at least a portion of this was an attempt to provide the right thing advice to devs when I would find something that was being done wrong. Because I think that's kind of a fail from a security, uh, app security point of view. Right? If I'm an app security person, I say, best practice is you shouldn't do this. And they say, great, what do I do? And you go, I don't know, you're just kind of screwed. Like, that's not a good answer. So hopefully this provides a good answer. Oh, the other background on this is more Jarrett's slide is that we surveyed our customers and said, look, like security, what, that, that's a broad term that sort of has not a lot of meaning specifically. What are the things you care about? And so we broke it into these buckets of data protection, endpoint network protection, identity access control, AppSec, vulnerability incident management, and configuration and patch management. And which ones were the ones you really care about? And data protection was by far, in a way, the most popular answer, right? And if you have data protections, you probably have key management issues. That's, Crypto right doesn't solve problems, it just moves them elsewhere. Right, so that was a big one. And then the other one that surprised me, quite honestly, is application security was the second biggest answer, which I, was, I did not expect, but those are some interesting numbers. So the other thing behind this was, at Rackspace we use OpenStack, right? That's what powers our cloud. And um, we have a lot of, obviously, DevStack, OpenStack developers in the organization and prior to one of the OpenStack summits, I was doing some reading of the, when they're proposing new features to OpenStack, they make uh, blueprints, right, that say, I want to do this with the service and this is how I think it should be implemented. And it's kind of a, a somewhat of a diagram and a little bit of code usually about a concept of how it should work. And so we started looking through before one of the OpenStack conferences last year at all these various systems and all of them wanted to start doing crypto of some sort. And we looked at Swift for example, and you look at the diagram and here's the Swift API nodes and here's the data storage layer and et cetera, et cetera. And then in the corner there's this little thing that said key manager, right? And you go and look at the, the code for it and it was a bunch of empty jo uh, uh, Python methods. <laughs> like so there was, a, there was a key manager but there wasn't really anything there. And then we keep seeing those in different parts of OpenStack. So if this had sort of gone on, there would have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different key managers in OpenStack, which is kind of ridiculous, right? This is a, a crucial bit of software that you need to really do right. And if it had gone kind of the way it was going, there would have been ten of these things. And so Rackspace said, you know what, we're just going to make our own and make it as part of OpenStack. And so this was where Barbican came from. Ah, and then the other one, and this was the paper napkin discussion of like no good answer for devs, right? If you have an app, if you're doing custom dev, inevitably you have some sort of scary data in a config file, right? Be it a database credentials, a API key, something, right? And particularly in the Linux world, there's not a really good answer as what you should do with that, right? What do you do? Well, you put it in Etsy and you own it by root, right? File permissions, uh, that's not such a great answer, right? How do we make this better? And so. One of the things we wanted to solve for is how can we give developers a method 
to do something a little more robust with managing the secret data that you have, usually config files or API keys or something, right? Um, a little more stronger. And we're also working on um, SSL keys as well. And I'll, I'll talk about that near the end. So, Barbagin Key Management as a Service, there are sort of three separate ways for you to deploy this, or three interaction models, let's say, um, depending on your risk level and your convenience level, quite honestly. So we have transparent encryption, federated keys, and on-premise are three different ways you can interact with Barbican, going from kind of least secure to more secure, and I'll talk through what those look like. So transparent encryption is basically we have your key and your data, and we encrypt it, right? So you as a user, you just save something into Swift, which is our object store, and it just gets encrypted, right? Obviously, this is the least secure because we have your key and we have your data, but if you just need a tick box for compliance or something that your data is encrypted, this will get you there. And certainly it's the simplest method uh, for you to manage this process, right? Because it's all just API calls. And then for uh, more risk adverse groups, we have this idea of federated keys where you would talk to the consuming service like Swift, the object store, and say, I want you to encrypt my data that's going into Swift. It would reach out to Barbican and Barbican would know this is a federated user and there's two different interaction models. This would either reach out to your on-premise Barbican install, get the key and push it back here, or tell the consuming service, Swift, you need to talk to that Barbican instance to get the key. So this way you have the key, but we have your data. And then the third one is on-prem, right? You just run it all yourself, and we have nothing, right? So those are your sort of three deployment options. So what does this guy look like? So at Rackspace, our deployment is a load balancer with some number of API nodes behind it. We have a queue from which workers read off of. We have a database to sort of store metadata. We have HSMs deployed, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. HSM is a hardware security module. It's a specifically hardened piece of gear to hold crypto keys. Uh, we use Ansible and Chef, and we have some metric services to keep track of everything that's going on. But this is sort of the standard, large-scale, horizontally scalable deployment, if you want to get an idea of what it would look like. And then key storage. So we found out when we were starting to, to create the Barbican service that a lot of the HSMs are really not made for multi-tenant. In fact, they're not entirely at all made for multi-tenant. And there are certain limitations on number of keys. And we don't want to score, store 100 keys. We want to store 100,000 keys. And so what we ended up doing was creating a key encryption key that stays and never leaves the HSM and that key is used to encrypt any keys owned by the tenant. So there's per tenant, oh and I should explain, tenant in OpenStack speak is customer. So per customer encryption keys, right? So all of your keys for that particular customer are encrypted with this one key encryption key. So you give us secret data, we encrypt it and then store it in the data store. And the HSM holds that key encryption key. So it's a way we can scale out HSMs, because we originally thought we'd just store everything in the HSM, but they just won't handle the, the throughput. And they're also not cheap devices <laughs> by any stretch. So we didn't want to have to buy 100 of them, right? Kind of makes it a cost-ineffective service to offer. And then the agent. So this was, this was the, a lot of my discussion with Jarrett Rehm about, well, this is great, and like if you're writing brand new apps, you just talk to our API, right? Hey, I need my my uh, encryption key and it will hand it to you, right? Cool, but what if you have legacy apps? Like, well, we all have apps that are in production running right now, like, what do you do? And so we ended up with this idea of using a Fuse file system. And a Fuse file system, this is all for Linux, by the way. A Fuse file system under Linux is a file, some code that sits between the kernel's system calls and user space calls to, to create a file system under Linux. So I can create what looks like and smells like and acts like a file system, but it's really my code running. We would use that to create a pseudo file system that was only in memory and then wrap policies around that. So now I can do things like know who, what, and when that file gets read and say who can read it and who can't read it and what's odd about it. And I'll show my, in my demo, I'll show this in, in process where we have a policy that says you can only read this once and you can't read it twice, right? So therefore you can't read it twice. And actually keep some of the, like the traditional attack scenario is I get access to a box or maybe I have directory traversal. 
the app can read the key, I can read the key, right? So I read that config file, I get all the goodies, I write up a nice pen test report, and I go home. All right, well, under this case, if you only let it read once, that app will start, it'll pull that stuff into memory, and then anybody else who touches that config, I can now notice. Because right now, as an app, for someone running a whole bunch of apps, you have no idea who's looking and reading at that, or interacting with that key or that secret material, right? Um, Keystone integrated, this is just the, uh, this is more for OpenStack. OpenStack's identity manager is called Keystone. So this is integrated with Keystone. And one of the nice things is that the agent that's running that Fuse file system can then talk back to the API and give you this out of band communication. Hey, this process read this file at this time, which you don't have right now, which is, I think, kind of cool. Ah, an example policy. So what do these policies look like? So uh, it's a policy. Here's this UUID, just a uniquely way to identify this, this specific policy. Time available after reboot, this is an idea if you can say, if it's more than 10 minutes after reboot, nothing should read it. I don't care if it's never been read, right? So you can have these various policies. The keys stanza, this is the secret, so this is 48, two, I think, characters of random data. You can say what group, and if you drop down a little bit, what owner can read that key. Here's a UUID just uniquely identifying the secret. You can attach expiration times, which is nice. Right now you can actually have an API that you can query to find out when your keys are expiring soon, right? Which for SSL, like, never happens, um, which is why we're using this for SSL at Rack. Um, but you could also do this for just key rotation, right, for uh, compliance reasons. I must rotate that key every 90 days. Now you have sort of a countdown timer tagged with that key. Um, cacheable means can you cache this? Can the agent cache this in memory, or does it have to make a request back to the API for every time? So if you're really concerned about someone getting access to that box. You can have the API, when I try to read that file, actually make an API call out, pull the key and hand it off and then drop it out of memory. So it's never even in memory for very long on, on the server. The MIME type is just a way to understand what might use this data because to Barbican it's just an arbitrary bunch of text, right? We don't pretend to know if this is an SSL cert or if it's just a, a password or whatever. Um, and then the file name, this is the file name that will be mounted in the directory on the server under Fuse. Now, tenant ID is just who owns it. Max key, ass, max key access is one, so I can only look at it one time. If I look at it twice, bad stuff happens. Uh, the directory under which to mount this is Etsy keys, and just a name for this policy, example ink, whatever you want to name it, right? Just a label so that you have a human readable, not a UUID to deal with when you're talking about these policies. Ah, and then events. So the agent has this like, concept of logging events, and you have multiple targets for events. You can write to a file, just traditional log files. You can write to syslog. And in the demonstration I'm going to show you today, we log back to the API. So this is a way to track the boxes sort of on a separate channel and off box, almost like shipping off your log files for access to anything that is confidential or secret or some, somehow sensitive. Um, the nice thing is that you can now get a hint that something's going on with the compromised server, right? I get access to a server, the first thing I want to do is look for the goodies. And that activity of looking for the goodies is going to cause these events to be propagated to the API or your syslog server or what have you. And now I have a chance to notice a compromise going on at the time it's happening, right? Depending on your policy, you can have what's called a panic. And when the agent panics, when you violate policy, depending on settings, the way I have the Proof of concept I'll show you is I drop everything from memory and I basically shoot myself in the head. Well, not me, but the agent, all right? Um, and so it just drops everything and goes away and nothing's on disk. After sending a message to the mothership saying bad things have happened. So in that case, if you have a bunch of API nodes serving a, a particular part of your infrastructure, node seven panics, you take it out of the uh, load balance or rotation, do forensics or whatever you need to to see what happened but pop up another one and off you go. Right? And it's a quick way to be able to react to compromises across a horizontally scaled application. I think I said everything, yes. Oh, and going off site obviously helps you with things like PCI, um, or off, off the box helps you with PCI and other compliance regimes. Yes, yes, cool. Come on. Oh, demo time, okay. Let me 
show you. So full disclosure, right? I have, oh, oh I got to move these over to the other window. So here's one VM running. Just a standard Linux install. There's a, hey you. There's a second VM running, standard Linux install. This one is Postern, which is the agent. And this one is Barbican, which is the uh, UI and API. And I need to drag this guy. Wow, well, that's going to be small. Okay. Wow. Let's see if I can make this work. In fact, hold on, I'm going to mirror my screens because I don't want to look over my head. Much better. Okay. Yay. I don't have to crane my neck. So we have Barbican here. This is where the API is running in the web interface. I'll show you. Poster in here, which is the, um, the agent running on a server, which would be where your app would be. And this is me sort of simulating interacting with that policy or the, the key file and showing you what happens if you violate policy. Where did Firefox go? There's Firefox. Okay. Cool. Oh, wrong one. Let me fire up Barbican. And there we go. So I'm going to log in. This is just a quick and dirty uh, web interface so I can have nice looking demos because like showing curl is not that exciting. Uh, come on, remember. Okay. So we have a tenant which is in Rackspace or OpenStack speak as a customer, right, which is just identified by this unique ID. We have a key like I mentioned earlier, right, so this, this key is bound by this policy Here's the unique ID for the key. Here's the file name, Secrets. Here's the application type. It's an it's a encryption key for AES. Here's our expiration date, 10-28 uh, of 2014. Here's the secret, those 40 some odd characters of random text. It'll be owned by root. It'll be group owned by root. And cacheable means that I can store it in memory on the uh, agent in the file system, the Fuse file system. And then if you look at policy, this is much like the example I showed you earlier. For this particular tenant or customer, here's a uniquely identifying, uh, uh, or a unique ID for this uh, policy. The name of it is the example policy. We're going to mount it under Etsy keys. It'll have one max access, and it can only be accessed 10 minutes after boot. All right? And if you notice, we have no events and no agents, right? So we need to fire up an agent and have it pair with this. Uh, this API. So I'm going to go back to Postern and fire up the agent. All right, so it says, like, is this readable? Yeah. Okay. So info logs into API and init complete. So I've mounted the Fuse file system. And, and the, there's a particular kernel module in the Linux kernel that lets me sort of intercept file system calls, and instead of going directly to the kernel, they go to my code, and then my code can either pass them back down to the kernel or do something. And so this is how I, I fake a file system uh, under Linux. And I, I will show you that in half a second. But first, if we go back to the events, you'll now notice for this tenant and this key and this agent ID at this time, I now have policy being enforced for Etsy key secrets on this host. All right, so now you know that the Agent is up, it's paired. Actually, here's the, the pairing of the agent, right? So the agent is up and paired. It's running on this particular host, poster and demo. It's running this particular OS version and the agent, I, like just the version for the agent, right? And so now we know that the, the agent is up and running and has a fuse file system mounted for this particular, uh, it would be like a config file for an app. And if we go back to here, and so I'm root and I'm in my home directory. I'm going to ls lah slash etsy keys. And it looks like a file system, right? So let's go ahead and cat slash etsy keys secrets. And there's that 42 character secret, right? Now if we go back 
Here, you'll notice that there's an info log. I did re exceed my uptime restriction because I fired these VMs up a long time ago. Um, there's an info log sent to the API, and if we go back to the web interface now and we refresh this, you'll notice that, hey, at this time and date, Etsy Key Secrets was, um, access to Etsy Keys Secrets was allowed by policy on that poster and demo host. So now we're actually getting visibility into something reading this file that has scary secret data in it. And if we go back and run this again, nothing. And let's go look at that directory, like what happened. There's not even a directory anymore. Now if we go back and look at the, my other uh, shell on Postern, I've panicked, right? There was a policy violation. I tried to read it twice, which is disallowed. And if we go back to the UI, you can see now that we've had a policy violation. I've panicked. And I've cleared out of memory, and there's now no secrets to be, to be read. So the, the idea with this is it allows you to actually have visibility and to access to these particular config files that are scary. Now, obviously, if you're writing a new app, I would directly call our API. That makes a hell of a lot more sense. Um, but there's also, we thought there's tons and tons of legacy existing code. Why not provide a means to be able to have uh, visibility into access and actually do restrictions upon access to those various files that you inevitably have to have? Because crypto, right, there's always a key that you have to do something with. And you can put the key in another key and encrypt it, but you just have this turtles all the way down thing. And so hopefully, this will allow you to get out of that race, or at least get some visibility into it. Let me go back here. Ah. Really? Uh, whatever. Okay. So what's next for uh, Barbican? Um, and I should mention the, um, well, the one thing. Barbican started out as a Rackspace project. It was always going to be an OpenStack project, and it's gone through the incubator process that was for OpenStack. So it's now an official part of OpenStack. You can download uh, Havana, which was the release before Icehouse. Or you can download Icehouse too. Um, and you will get uh, the latest Barbican code. Why am I getting that silly resolution thing? That's really annoying. There we go. Okay. Sorry, that was annoying me. Um, so it's now official part of OpenStack. If you want to download and get this, the only things you need to run it is Barbican and uh, Keystone, which is the identity service for um, OpenStack. And there's plugins for, ident for Keystone to plug it into AD or various LDAP stores if you want to sort of tie it into your existing infrastructure. Um, the current state of what they're working on next for Icehouse, which is the next uh, OpenStack release, is KeyMIP support, which is, I'll be honest, kind of funny because everybody asks for KeyMIP support and then you ask them, do you use KeyMIP? And they say no. <laughs> KeyMIP is the, what is it, the key management interaction protocol or something like that, I can't remember, but it's a, it's a standard for handing, um, doing key management uh, between two hosts. And it's, I guess it's a good standard, it's an Oasis thing, but like nobody has actually implemented it. So one of the HSM vendors, SafeNet, is actually writing a Python KeyMIP library. Um, and if and when that happens, we'll integrate that into Barbican, or if not, we may just end up writing our own because we get the question all the time, but it's sort of like a chicken egg thing. Like people want it, but nobody's using it. So I'm not quite sure the value of it there. Um, SSL and TSS, this is another great thing that I think is really gonna help with Barbican. Now you can manage all of your certs and we're integrating with either internal or external uh, uh, certificate authorities to where you can now get issue and manage certs all through Barbican, which if you have an HSM now is backed by an HSM and you have things like countdown timers and you can write uh, web interfaces talking to REST that'll let you know this cert is expiring in so many days, right? It's sort of a nice centralized managed place to handle all those SSL certs. Um, we have federation going and we're working on the, the additional uh, federation methods like the one, the method I talked about where you talk to say Swift or the service, it talks to the Rackspace's Barbican and then it talks out. We've got the uh, service Rackspace's Barbican to a third party's Barbican. 
and then back out avoiding Barbican, but both models we haven't got quite worked out yet, so the second of the two models is not done. Um, and well, this is really more OpenStack directed, but we're working with the various and sundry OpenStack teams that want encryption to integrate with Barbican so that there is the key manager for OpenStack and not N key managers for OpenStack, because that was a bit of a problem. Um, and if you want to play with it now, you can. Uh, we have a Python Barbican client. Uh, it's open source and on GitHub. Actually, all of this stuff is open source and on GitHub. Um, they've got very good documentation and their source code. There's an integration environment if you want to play with this and talk to a Barbican API. Um, that's fine. It's obviously for dev only. I wouldn't put anything you give a rat's A about um, because this is a dev environment. Do not put real secrets in this, right? <laughs> this is where we make sure the clients work. This is not where you put real stuff. Um, and there's also a command line client called Keep, staying with the castle motif, um, that allows you to do client operations so you don't have to type these big long rest strings or big ugly curl. Wow, and that's it. That was quicker than I thought it was going to be. So the Teams that's on uh, Pound OpenStack Cloud Keep on Freenode, GitHub slash CloudKeep is where all the code is, and Barbican at list.google.org is where all the devs sit and answer questions. And pull request accepted gladly if, if this is something of use. Oh, and I should mention, if you look at the, the code that I demoed, you will notice it was Barbican-POC. <laughs> it's proof of concept. So the, the policy is not implemented in the official OpenStack instance yet. That's being worked on currently. We basically wanted to prove out it worked before we actually did the whole get it into OpenStack thing. So this code should land. I'm working on a Go version of the agent now. And hopefully this code should land by Icehouse, which is this fall, I think, September, maybe October. So this should be for reals available in September, October. Any questions? No one wants going twice? <laughs> Sold. Well, thank you very much.